नमस्कार प्रवेश जी थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बीइंग पार्ट ऑफ अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशंस इट्स अ ट्रूली एन ऑनर फॉर यू टू बी पार्ट ऑफ दिस सीरीज सो फ्रॉम चाइल्डहुड व्हाट वुड बी योर अर्लीएस्ट रिकॉलेक्शन ऑफ द आइडिया ऑफ नॉन वायर well my father was uh, a muslim but he was uh, he had only hindu friends and uh, he was devastated by partition his so after partition his friends who had left he sold off their properties and then sent them the money to india he was also uh, a follower of uh, mahatma gandhi is very odd you might say for a muslim but yes that's the way it was and uh, i remember uh, him telling us and my mother telling us that they were in pune and that's when uh, gandhi ji had placed his uh, hand on my brother's head so that's uh, non violence but i wasn't convinced of non violence and i'm not uh, totally convinced of it even now there are times when you have to counter violence with violence i mean if you were in in nazi germany what would you try and preach to hitler you couldn't do that you couldn't do it to stalin you couldn't do it to mao you couldn't do it in many places in the world even today however as a strategy i think that it is at times worthy of pursuing i think that uh, when one party is uh, very weak then it cannot afford to start violence because it will get crushed and there were mistakes made uh, by people who have struggled when they have used violence and i'll give you the example of the palestinians they missed out on opportunities when there was the possibility of using non violence in palestine and they didn't use it instead they got crushed by the israelis so i'd say that uh, to me non violence is about strategy it's to be used when possible and in other places it's not possible mm -hmm. if we were to uh, look at it from your field um you have been a leading voice in the opposition to nuclear weapons um and uh, you're a sponsor of the uh, bulletin of atomic scientists uh you know gandhi was asked probably it's possible that this conversation took place on the last day just hours before he was killed he was asked by margaret brook white that don't you think that after atomic weapons have been invented that non violence is now impossible and gandhi replied saying on the contrary it's the only thing that is left in the field um because his his logic was that with atomic weapons the human capacity for violence has crossed all thresholds it has gone to such an extreme that uh, now only a kind of complete counter to that would uh, be the uh, way to Uh, protect and build civilization uh, how would you respond to this what gandhi is saying yes i think that makes a lot of sense um, there are countries that have nuclear weapons and there are countries that don't have nuclear weapons and yet the world continues to exist now uh, ideally we would like no nuclear weapons with any country and uh, one is always frightened when another country acquires nuclear weapons i did not want india to make nuclear weapons and i did not want pakistan to make nuclear weapons and yet both did so they've obviously crossed the threshold and uh, how things will play out in long into the future one doesn't know but the way to to counter nuclear weapons is through reason logic and point and to keep pointing out that their that their use would lead to total and utter destruction and that this lies within the realm of possibilities because nuclear weapons can even be used when there's no intent to use them 
there's the there's always the chance of a, a accidental use of somebody flying off the handle of miscommunication of lots of things that can happen and so i'd say that uh, yeah the best thing is to get rid of them but when you can't get rid of them then rely up upon diplomacy rely upon uh, all possible means except uh, having confrontations violent confrontations between countries which have nuclear weapons because that is terribly terribly dangerous yeah yeah you've also been uh, you're a part of the world federation of scientists and i think you're on you serve on a panel uh, inside this federation on the issue of terrorism uh, would you like to speak about that a little bit can you tell us what that work is about So that group hasn't been active in a while. Uh, I must say that terrorism was high on the world's agenda immediately after 9-11. It has over time decreased. It has been, uh, well, um, after um, the attempts made by Daesh, ISIS, mm -hmm. which uh, they effectively took over much of Syria and parts of Iraq, but they were ultimately crushed. And so today it is not the highest thing on the world's agenda. However, it exists in many different forms in many parts of the world, including here in Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and the kinds of terrorism that we see today are uh, of course, religiously motivated. Hmm. Now, when something gets religiously motivated, then it can go in any direction and it can be aimed against even those who um, initially sponsored it. Yeah. Uh, terrorism today, uh, let's look at the Taliban. The Taliban today are actually a threat to Pakistan. Not so much to India, but to Pakistan. Every day, Pakistani soldiers get killed by the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, the TTP. Yeah. If, and so terrorism, especially religiously motivated terrorism, uh, is, uh, is it, it just escapes and can then, is, is really a wild card. It yeah. can go in any direction. Yeah. You know, in a sense, all of us who uh, perhaps grown up, uh, that we've been trained intellectually on a worldview, uh, which was based on the assumption that as a species, we are moving towards greater and greater achievements in through reason. And that uh, blind, hatred rage animosity and all and the violence that results from these kinds of emotions uh, will become a thing of the past this is the post war war world's assumption where did it go wrong what happened or was the assumption itself flawed to begin with i think it is um, a fallacy to think that uh, the present times are more violent than earlier times. Okay. Um, I'm actually quite convinced by the argument that Stephen Pinker makes, uh -huh. and he's got some archeological evidence for it too, that if you look at past centuries, mm -hmm. those centuries were not more peaceful than the present times. If mm -hmm. you look at the wars that happened then, the massacres, the bloodletting, there was an absence of any kind of universal norms. And so even though the weapons then were not by any means as destructive as those at, in present times, yet, if you look at the fraction of populations that were consumed by the use, that, that were killed by the use of those weapons, that fraction was substantially larger than as compared to now. So yes, um, we've got nuclear weapons, but they haven't been used. We've, there are lots of weapons, 
which uh, every country possesses, particularly the big ones. But fortunately, they don't get used that much. So what we have to prevent is their use. And of course, uh, if we can, to stop them from being made in the first place. Yeah. I don't think reason has gone wrong. Um, what else do we have? There are only two things. One is reason, the other is faith. And faith, faith is very, very dangerous, in my opinion, because you can have faith in good things, but you can also have faith in bad things. Yeah. And uh, because there's no way that you can know whether a faith is good or bad, once you give your mind to faith, then you're done for. Then you're done for. J what was it, Jonestown or Jamestown? That's right. That, that whole group of so many uh, uh, hundreds, they just swallowed poison. They said, oh, this is our faith. We're going to go to heaven, to the kingdom of Christ or whatever. That sort of thing is can't be stopped unless you rely upon reason. And reason is the strongest thing. Yeah. Absolutely the strongest thing that humans possess. Indeed, indeed. And what I meant, in fact, was that uh, the expectation of the 20th century was that more and more, uh, there will be more and more coherence between faith and reason in that sense that uh, uh, blind faith uh, will not uh, stamp out reason. Um, and the resurgence of hatred and um, uh, identity-based animosities that we are now seeing and how much of it is being put into physical action, that is what I meant, that it doesn't that indicate a kind of undermining of reason. Or to put it another way... It uh, is, it is. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, we, we have to see uh, where our values derive from the need for humans to prosper. Because if we didn't have those values, and those values, the biggest value among them is to be able to cooperate with other human beings, and to be able to get along with them. Now, if we were like cats, we wouldn't be able to work together. You know, I have a lot of cats. And by the way, my cat is uh, knocking at the door, but I'm not going to let him in. But these cats don't get along with each other, but we humans can. And the fact that we humans can cooperate with each other means that we've developed ways of linking up. Now, there's because of our evolutionary uh, uh, upbringing, uh, of our evolutionary history, we've had to survive in, in the jungle. And like uh, apes, we have territoriality built into us. Like apes, we get very violent when our tribe uh, is confronted by another tribe. And so these uh, inter-tribal wars are very, very serious, very, very severe. However, they are irrational. As humans realize that, and so cooperation effectively trumped competition. Yeah. What we are seeing now is a form of regression. So when... Um, you see uh, Imran Khan or Narendra Modi or uh, uh, Donald Trump or so many white races appealing to base instincts. They're really regressing. They're, they're, uh, they're going back on the evolutionary tree. And that happens, you know, that um, evolution is never a straight path. Mm -hmm. And so... I think we are in a period of regression, but a temporary one. We'll get out of it. So this, it's interesting now. Uh, in 
in science, evolution has a kind of inner dynamic. It's not moved by human volition. And yet we are in a situation where when we see the hatred and the tension and the violence around us, uh, we feel moved to action. We feel that it is it will be through our interventions and volition that this regression, this period of regression will perhaps fade away or you know, we'll move into the next phase. So how would you look at that? What, what is the role of human intervention here? And to what extent is it a natural flow of things? Okay, so um, let me be very specific. Mm -hmm. Here in Pakistan, Imran Khan is pushing the idea that uh, Islamophobia reigns across the world. Mm -hmm. And um, he says uh, Muslims are being discriminated against in Europe, in America, here, there. And uh, there's a genocide of Muslims in India. All right. But what's happening to to non-Muslims in Pakistan. Now, it's important for us, people like me, to point that out mm -hmm. and say that, look, if you're nasty to your non-Muslims, by on what grounds can you say that um, Europe being nasty to Muslims, if it is, is wrong? You have to have a leg on which to stand on. And it is by making this logical point that we can argue against racism. Because if you're, if you're nasty to another race or to another religion or to another ethnic group or to another linguistic group, well, then what happens to your own group? Your own group then gets attacked. And so isn't it better that uh, we all recognize our 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 common humanity and be nice to each other as human beings and to judge individuals on the basis of universal values. Yeah. There are universal values today. At one time it was thought that ah, these are just Western values, but I'm strongly convinced that there are such things as universal values. And it is on the basis of that, that we can cooperate with each other, we can talk to each other, and we can settle our differences. And that's the use of reason logic. Bilkul, bilkul. I, I, just before uh, we met today, I was watching your lecture on the rise and fall of science uh, uh, among Muslims. Historically, you've done an amazing uh, historical uh, uh, you know, account of that whole journey. Uh, could you give us a brief sense of how you see the issue today? Uh, what are the prospects of uh, a science-based um, Islam, say, in the rest of the 21st century? Any prospects? Uh, 21st century is a bit uh, too soon, but it, it'll it'll come later at some point or the other, because um, it has to be realized that, uh, and uh, a lot of Muslims do realize that they're not organized in a way that they could uh, get things done, but they do realize that the world today is a very different world from that of the seventh century, that what there is in the Quran is actually um, not good enough for uh, meeting the challenges of the 21st century. That uh, if you simply insist upon that as being the last word, well, then you're going to be stuck with it. You're going to be stuck with the fact that uh, you can't move along and accept the, the new science the the facts that have been re, that have um, now been revealed by observation by uh, by experiment by the enormous advances of science over the last three hundred years. So, but let me recap what I've been essentially arguing. So, the way that science entered Islam was not through the Qur'an. It came 150 years after the death of the Holy Prophet. 
And it came because Muslims had expanded into surrounding areas out of Arabia, and uh, they, there they encountered the treasures of Greek learning, which they were open-minded enough to take advantage of, translate, and then add on hugely to that. So I think civilizationally, at that time, Islam was by far the most advanced of its time. Correct. Every civilization has had um, uh, a rise and then a fall, and the fall came for Islam when the mullah take o took over. So there were enlightened, open-minded caliphs between the 9th and the 13th centuries, and they were willing to let all kinds of people come to the courts, to the darbars, and so Jews and Christians and um, uh, uh, Muslims all worked together. And it was that kind of a, a community of scientists which was then able to generate new ideas. When that stopped and when traditional thought took over, well, that was the end of science in Islam. So sadly, it hasn't recovered from that. There have been attempts to recover it in parts of the world. I am uh, hopeful that, uh, okay, not in this century, maybe the next. <laughs> you have Muslims spoken... will collectively realize. Right, right. You have spoken Did... about how the Iranian regime has managed to separate state uh, science and, and religion. Would you like to say a bit about that? I wouldn't say they've totally separated it, but they've given a lot more leeway. And uh, what one sees is um, that Iran is uh, on the scale of Muslim countries, together with Turkey, is uh, far ahead. And uh, uh, that's, that's why, in fact, they managed to keep the United States and Israel so scared mm. with all their developments, with their bombs and their drones and whatever, but they're also pretty good at theoretical physics, and they're very good at uh, molecular biology as well. Sem stem cell research in Iran is, is uh, thriving. Yeah. Why were they able to do it? Well, as you know, in Islam, there are there's the Sunni and the Shia. The Shias have historically been persecuted by the Sunnis, and they've been in hiding. And so like a bit like the Jews of Europe, they've been concentrating on, on intellectual matters mm. while while being in hiding. And um, uh, if you look at Iran's history, it, um, it goes back even before Islam. So culture over there has uh, trumped dogmatism. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the mullahs in, in Iran, mm -hmm. they're pretty bad, but uh, they're not as bad as the mullahs of the Sunni world. They do allow some amount of thought, some leeway. So for example, someone asks Imam Khomeini, Khomeini uh, what do you think about uh, evolution, biological evolution? And he said, what's your problem with that? He says, uh, it's against Islam. He said, no, it's not. Let biology be biology. Let mathematics be mathematics. There's no such thing as Islamic mathematics. And so I'd say that um, in that respect, they were uh, better than most other Muslims and probably uh, quite a bit better than some of the people you have in India who uh, are out for Vedic science and for the, and Modi ji as well, who claims that there were spacecraft going between Mars and Earth some back in ancient times and about uh, we've heard this about the first plastic surgery being carried out and his um, uh, blowing that, what, what do you call that, uh, the, the shell? Ji. Conch. Mm. Uh. Uh, so that sort of stuff is there all over, but I think it's less in Iran, more in Pakistan. Ji, ji. Uh, you know, for Gandhi, uh, reason itself is a form of nonviolence, or at least it's it's part of the, uh, the the process by which 
one strives to be non-violent. Would that seem like something that you could relate to? Uh, not totally, because um, reason can also help you to fight wars in a more bloody way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, reason by itself doesn't come with values. It has to be um, compassion and human values together with reason that makes for a happier uh, civilization, happier planet, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't say that uh, science is ever going to be enough for solving the world's problems. In fact, it's added quite a bit to them. Yeah. It's got to be values plus that. Now, where do values come from is a very difficult issue. That's right. I believe that in part, that's, that too is guided by reason. After all, um, uh, we, we, the reason we don't lie is because if we did lie to each other, most of the time at least, then it wouldn't be possible to have a, a, a civilization because um, nobody would trust each other. Yeah. And so we wouldn't be able to work together. And so we wouldn't be able to protect ourselves from wild animals or the weather or whatever. That's right. That's right. Well, actually, this is how Gandhi, uh, I think, uh, sees it, that he, he for him, the com combination of reason and moral commitments is is a kind of inextricable thing. Uh, have you ever dwelt on Oppenheimer's uh, grappling with these problems? I was curious if you have any view on the Oppenheimer story and his his both his uh, unrest about the bomb and his invocation of the uh, you know the philosophical. Uh, passage from the from the Gita. Any 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 well, comments? Well, look, uh, I I know that uh, he dabbled uh, in in various things. He was basically a physicist, a very good physicist, and um, he was uh, at one point consumed by guilt at having been so important for the bomb. He did have progressive tendencies within him. But um, I'd say that's true for pretty much um, a lot of physicists. Hmm. So I, I, I don't know any more than that. Okay. Um, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I wanted to pass on a message to you because I just spoke to this friend a minute or two before we started our conversation. So Sachin Rao is a member of the Congress party and he runs a series called Ahimsa Ke Raste camps. Uh, they are four day camps, completely, uh, you know, self subscribed. People pay to their own fare, they pay for their food. And they are basically ways of exploring how we can bring nonviolent action into actual practice, both in our own lives and in politics. So, Sachin said to please give you uh, uh, Guru Dakshina Pranam because. He is so moved by the film that you are part of among the believers. Uh, and he says that they always play. Mm. Uh, it's part of their, sometimes it's part of the resource material in the Ahimsa Ke Raste camps. And, uh, and, and that for them, the highlight of the film is, is your role and you know what you have to say there. So one is I wanted to pass, he, I'll send you his Ahimsa conversation in which he talks about these camps. Uh, that's quite- Well, my uh, regards to him. I, I will. My uh, regards to him and thanks for uh, having watched that uh, movie. Actually, um, the, the credit goes to those who made the movie and I didn't really have a hand in that. They asked me for comments and um, that's that's all that I did over, over there. Right. And and I, I must confess, I've not seen the whole film, but I saw parts of it uh, a short while back. And I was wondering, how do we have any hope of convincing or, uh, you know, bringing a change of heart among those who are so deeply committed to a worldview based on a kind of perpetual conflict? Uh, 
do you ever despair about that i think humans have an ability to learn and i am hoping that they will learn once uh, things are explained to them but they don't learn by themselves they have to be they have to be um, persuaded into a way of thinking now let's look at what's happening in afghanistan where that fundamentalist way of thinking is uh, is universal now they're welcome to that but then they're destroying themselves and the taliban now have uh, have no opposition in afghanistan they are now responsible for everything that happens over there they're making a mess of it let the world see that let the afghan population see that as well and the seeds of resistance will develop because of that so it might take more time than than uh, than one lifetime suffices after a few lifetimes after a couple of generations i think afghanistan will be very different i think pakistan will be very different too and i think india is already changing in what way changing in what way well you are you're seeing now the 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 effects of fundamentalism mm. in India, mm. of Hindu fundamentalism. Mm. And you're seeing now what kind of a society that is leading to. And you're seeing that it's not nice in many ways. Because of that, there is now a gelling of forces against that. And in time, they will be able to fix some of the worst aspects of this so if we think of india 50 years from now and pakistan 50 years from now we can be hopeful that they will have moved towards better societies more respectful of women more respectful of the rights of of others who don't belong to their religion or to their uh, caste or whatever and so progress i think is universal you see this let's let's look at um, india 300 years ago mm -hmm. before the or even even uh, earlier mm -hmm. um a thousand years ago mm -hmm. was there any concept of democracy anywhere at that time was there a concept that women should be in any way equal to men no Quite apart from that, the poverty, the fact that uh, kids would die uh, mostly at, at childbirth. So there has been human progress and that's why we need to be optimistic even though today things seem so dark everywhere. Hmm. Uh, you have been very closely involved in Indo-Pak friendship efforts at a citizen to citizen level. Uh, looking back on that, I think several decades of effort. How do you feel today? What are what are some of the positives that we can still build upon? From those times, I still have friends in India with whom I can occasionally talk. Unfortunately, now it is so very difficult to cross the border. They don't give you visas anymore, and um, because I don't travel very much outside of Pakistan. Um, I don't get to meet uh, my my friends, um, who, uh, my my Indian friends, and I can't make new friends. Mm. Not at, I mean, uh, here th there are hardly any. Um, well, but here I don't get to meet people from India at all, mm. or for that matter, from any other country. And so, looking back at all that effort. I would say that um, we haven't been successful. After all, it is the 
political leaders on both sides who determine the direction in which things go. Yeah. And uh, especially uh, with the rise of Hindutva in India and with, uh, with uh, I'd say, the reassertion of the army in Pakistan, the army was challenged by Nawaz Sharif. The Nawaz Sharif did try to make friends with India, which is actually the major reason why he lost his job. Mm. Um, but those times could come back again. Mm. 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 So yeah, sorry, the, the point is the point is that you have to keep trying. And so, okay, we didn't bring about peace between India and Pakistan. Yeah, we were just uh, too few. <laughs> But you know what? If they open the borders, if they let people to cross, they, if they let people cross, and those people can go and see the other side, there'll be a major change of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying it's a kind of product of ignorance that uh, cultivates the hatred and the suspicion and the animosity. Absolutely. It's you can manufacture stories about the other side and not only can that's what's happening the 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 bad of course there are bad things happening in pakistan very bad things and i've been screaming at the top of my, of my voice about them yeah. but um if if you were to come here if my indian friends were to come here they'd also see so much similarity in terms of normal things that uh, these would then appear as an aberration yeah and of course vice versa the point is there's always going to be conflict within society but to demonize the other is uh, very easy to see that they are like us they're mostly like us they're 80 percent like us that makes a huge huge difference and yeah uh, the establishments in particular the Pakistani establishment, now the Indian establishment, now the Indian government too. But the Pakistani government never wanted, never wanted Pakistani citizens to go over to the Indian side. Why? Because then the cause of conflict would be lessened. Then there would be less, uh, th then the population yeah. couldn't be persuaded that we have an imminent threat, a mortal threat from across the border. And so then what would happen to our army? Hmm? The, that's yeah. why they don't want a mixing of the populations. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that raises a question at a global level also, that uh, isn't there a powerful vested interest uh, by the military industrial complex that keeps so many of the conflicts and the violence in the world going? Military, yes, but it's the national state. The state wants to have a monopoly of, uh, of uh, power within the country. Yeah. And so uh, they want these very um, harsh borders yeah. and they want total dominance within their own country. This, for this, they've got to build up nationalism and nationalism is something that's very dangerous so even without religion even without religion nationalism can be catastrophic we saw this in europe we saw wars between uh, between germany and the rest of europe on that no and more uh, recently the breakup, of, the, the breakup of yugoslavia once you start, of uh, absolutely yugoslavia is such a brilliant example of that anytime some people think that oh there's nobody like us we're the best in the world then that idea of supremacy whether it's national supremacy or religious supremacy or ethnic supremacy you know ethnicity is also pretty dangerous so uh, uh, if we if we are to live together in peace we've got to we've got to understand that there's no real difference between any two human beings. Yeah, that's of course the crux of it. Um, any advice? What a lot of young people want to pursue the values that you represent, that you have, you know, spoken about and campaigned for at so many different levels. 
uh, and sometimes some of them feel daunted these days so uh, in closing what advice or what uh, guidance would you offer to these young people so that you know they feel more charged i'd say it's just take a look from space you see this <laughs> <laughs> you see this pale blue dot distant star you know that's how carl sagan would put it and uh, all these little fights that we have with each other they're essentially irrelevant we are an intelligent species which um, has problems of course those problems arise partly out of intelligence but a higher use of that intelligence can help us solve those problems so take a wider look at things see yourself not as an indian or as a pakistani see yourself as a south asian okay that's one thing but then why see yourself as a south asian you're part of a bigger human family the, the chinese over there there are the africans there and there are the Europeans and everybody. Look at our genes. I mean, the genetic similarity, and here is where science also helps. The genetic similarity between humans is so, so great as compared to any other species. That, yeah. uh, let science guide you on that. That's right. That's right. In fact, uh, I believe there are uh, certain chimps with whom we have only a one point something percent uh, difference in, in the genetic uh, makeup. You have to go to a logarithmic scale. Um, the difference between us and chimps is huge as compared to the distance, to the genetic distance between two humans, whether of course, they are of course. African blacks or uh, Hispanics or whatever. That's yeah. right. So you are, I, 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 I must thank you for this uh, optimistic view of life. And, and last, I, I have a somewhat personal question to put to you, that you're clearly opposed to nationalism. And yet, uh, you gave up a, a, a potentially lucrative scientific career in the West, and you chose to come back and live in Pakistan. Why? Uh, it's not the lucrative. I do miss not being able to do good science here. And um, yeah, that's, that, that's uh, the cost that one pays. But then he's been compensated in other ways. I'm, uh, I'm fine here. I'm happy here. I've spent most of my life doing whatever I wanted to, um, enjoyed it. Um, so um, yeah, I think on balance, um, it worked out well. And how are you? Why? How are you so fearless? Because I know you must be under threat from any number of people for offending their faith, for a, uh, for I don't know, alleged blasphemy and and what not. So how do you cultivate this fearlessness? Oh, it's very easy. I don't have social media and um, I rarely use the phone. So um, I'm quite happy not, not hearing threats. It's, uh, it's, it's um, there might be, but as I say, sticks and stones may break my, my bones, but words shall never hurt me. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a, it's really been a pleasure and an honor. Anything that we left out, is there anything that I that you would like to add to this discussion? No, I just wish that um, we could meet in person. <laughs> yes, I wish I that I could. Uh, I wish that I could meet all my other friends in India. Um, same, my good wishes to all of them. I will. I will, and the same to all the friends there. Namaskar. Thank you so much.